Yeah. But then, like, uh, it's fine. L- okay, let's do it like 13 minutes. How about that? Like, or like 12 minutes. 12 minutes. All right, then 12 minutes. I'll get a timer uh, yeah. set up for that then. All right, so All right. with that, just uh, begin when you're ready. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, we would like to mention about a court case. And then with that court case, there are two lawyers. Each of the lawyers would prove his defendant innocent or guilty. And then what will happen is that both of them will talk to the judge and say uh, different things, uh, trying to prove that their defendants are guilty and the other defendant is uh, innocent. And then what will happen is um, after like a long debate with no evidence, what will show up is an evidence. If there was a physical evidence, most of the claims will be different, you know, and most of the claims will be deleted. And so what will happen is usually, generally, what, uh, when we were speaking, um, things like the motives, the hows, the whys, all these things are going to be- get deleted with, like, let's say, a whole camera footage of someone killing someone or, like, fingerprints, alibis, all these, like, physical evidences. And so this is the exact same thing with well, what we're going to discuss today. So basically, uh, before actually going into lots of discussions and lots of things that to, to debate about, how about having a physical evidence to prove that one of uh, the religions is a true religion? And for Islam, uh, we, uh, we verified how uh, the Holy Quran and the Sahih hadiths or quotes haven't been edited since the time of Prophet وسلم, using the narrators and the chain methods. And then um, this begs the question, if it's a true religion, does, which is a necessity in my belief, uh, Islam address all types of people? Well, actually, yes. It's also the only miracle, in my opinion, that uh, uh, challenged the, the uh, time. And how did that uh, did, uh, do that? First, uh, 1400 years ago, people were um, so uh, competent in literature in the Arab region. And so the most literate person, like literally the wisest person at that time, uh, was only good at poetry and generosity, like nothing else, literally. And so uh, what happened is that Islam challenged them and the fluency of the language and the fluency of the literature itself of the book to, provo- to prove that these are words from God, not words from a human. And who is that human who's saying these words or providing them to people? He's a person who cannot read nor write. So that was the first miracle in itself. And th- that is until today hasn't been changed one word. Nobody could have challenged it, you know, in its fluency. And then, okay, that's like the miracle at that time. What's the miracle regarding this time at the Holy Quran? Well, basically, if we see at uh, how uh, people are actually generally interested in proofing, uh, proving a religion or an idea, especially like with atheism and these kinds of things, we see that uh, these people tend to go a lot into um, uh, sciences, you know, and um, scientific facts and these kinds of things. While we see all these scientific facts, we actually notice that Islam goes hand in hand with lots of these scientific facts. So first of all, let's say the word alaqa which is basically the second stage of an embryology. And alaqa has been described very accurately in the Holy Quran, which in itself is a miracle. So what happened is that alaqa means a blood uh, clot. It also means a uh, something to be hanged, which is uh, hanged in the mother's home in this case. And it also means a blood leech, which is an insect that looks exactly like alaqa in its uh, embryology state. And what happens is that, okay, some people who say, no, but the Greeks also discovered something uh, sort of that sort, you know. First of all, um, the Greeks misfired a lot while mentioning this. And this came from someone who is a scientist, uh, unlike Prophet Sallallahu And unlike the people at that time where they actually were the worst at science and literature. That uh, I mean, like uh, scientific literature at that time. Uh, also, one more thing to uh, also add on. Uh, is that um, uh, some people would also say like, hey, these are theories that Greeks mentioned or Greeks didn't mention and some information can go around and reach uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First, it is uh, uh, very, very hard to receive information from people who don't even care about science, but let's say that they do. How did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam choose the right theory that goes with a good interpretation while there are many other theories that don't. For example, with the uh, 
uh, flat earth and the round earth. But then one more important thing is like the astrophysics of the Holy Quran, where uh, God specifically specifically says in the Surah Al-Rad, uh, which is like, if we open a door to the sky for them, uh, they would have ascended, but look at the word that he mentioned, يعرجون, not any ascending, but the ascending that vibrates and moves left and right. So uh, the Holy Quran is a very fluent, literature that is also describing precisely and accurately whatever it wants to describe uh, and thus uh, this led into something that nobody could have discovered at that time because flying machines especially rockets and these uh, missiles they were like only hundreds of years ago you know like with the world wars now one more thing to mention like uh, that's from the physics scientific side that cannot be disproved and that is enough evidence for like atheists to also believe in um uh, there's also this other side of logic and philosophy about the religion of islam itself by the way how many minutes do i have left um regarding your time you have six minutes oh perfect okay so now with the with the logic and explanation of uh, the islam itself a true religion that we believe in should appeal to all people, should address all types of ideologies. One of the first things that it should address is atheism, since it's actually very pro uh, prevalent now. And it did. Uh, uh, when Allah said, Are they the creators? Uh, are they were created without anything? Or are they the creators? Or maybe when uh, he said uh, uh, that uh, just like on the judgment day, uh, that just like you were created now you will be recreated in the judgment day so it's like easy for our god to do this and then also one more thing is that uh maybe okay like other types of people like ideologies like feminists for example who want women rights and women equality and these kinds of things well islam provided a perfect set of laws that existed from the time of muhammad sallallahu until now that even when uh, countries like france and the european countries wanted to make their institution they actually took a lot of it from the holy quran in itself uh, in fact if we look at um the protestant ideology of how to do things uh just like we talked last time uh there is like no literally um written uh, law that we can actually apply but to whatever we feel right and that in itself is a big mistake in my opinion because it is first of all illogical because no one in a human being would actually make a good law but they will improve over time so uh and like until 100 years ago women were treated as a an object that could be sold so like that's uh, 1900 years of uh, unequality or like uh, unfairness and then the other, other thing that we want to mention about logic in itself is the theory of the one and the many and then in the one and the many thing um First of all, a one God makes it much more easier to understand because um, having a an absolute power, an absolute intellectual, an absolute uh, merciness, absolute everything is much easier than having an absolute something, but then a different absolute something, which is the other God, uh, a father and a son, and then they would complement each other. But then that in, in itself disproves uh the absoluteness of anything. But then if we also mention that oh, the one and the many is about um having like let's say a general thing and then subcategories and then uh for a car maker what uh, what is a car and a car maker like what is the one and many and these kinds of things if someone makes a car that's exactly the same thing as a god creating a universe in fact we were also uh categorized and like hey we're all made up by water you know we are all made up by some things you know uh, we're all creations of god but there is one God, and that's uh, the biggest evidence is in the story of Adam السلام, when he uh, was being created, before he created him, uh, Allah Azzajal mentions, hey, I'm going to create a human. And then the angels themselves ask, are you going to make a human that is uh, going to kill and do these kinds of things? And uh, he said, I know what you guys do not know. And then uh, it begs the question, uh, uh, do I have time to actually continue? Uh, you have about two minutes, 50 seconds. Okay, yeah, two minutes, 50 seconds, perfect. Um, and then uh, when you look at the story, the differences between the uh, Christian uh, story and the Islamic story, the Islamic story is much more natural and makes much more sense. It was just a normal tree in heaven. Uh, Adam was actually predestined to live in the earth and God actually prepared him for living in the earth by making him make a decision, ma making him know that he has an enemy, which is the devil, making him also 
uh, learn uh, things and naming things and how to deal with things. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to also add on uh, with Christianity is like the difference between Christianity and Islam and logic and order is like, first of all, if I want to make a country or I want to make a nation, uh, how do I determine the laws? If like two Protestants, for example, uh, decide something, how would they claim that one thing uh, is right and the other is wrong? Okay, you'd say it's a feeling, but then both of them claim a feeling. Actually, a whole matter of fact, when we are uh, kind of in between two situations and no, don't know what we choose, which is exactly what happens in like lots of cases, like going into a job or anything. We have a whole prayer called istikhara, which is asking God to help you to choose the right decision. Um, in uh, Protestantism, how do we know that uh, we uh, know which act is true, which act is not? Okay, according to feeling, but if they both claim that they feeling the right thing about it, okay, we'll pray more. But then if they still claim the right thing, about uh, about it then we'll go into a, a loop of illogical responses like hey just claim and then that's the main issue of anything re regarding logic with logic and philosophy usually there are things that are related to confirmation bias and there are things that are related to hey we can end it i am right in my own uh, regard and you're right in your own regard but with physical and uh, determined things and like evidences and proof there is no such thing as that and then what will happen is that there is at the end someone who's right someone who's wrong based on things to do to figure out what's right and what's wrong just like i mentioned to you about the four measurements of uh, our four ways of determining something is uh, uh, like morally right or not uh, like uh, prohibited or not uh, and uh, they are uh, first uh, l listening to the quran listening to the hadith and then the measurements method and then the ijma method and that comes at last all right so with that i will begin mine and i would just like to point out the thank you for you know having the conversation uh about oh this. no of you... course man i'm actually more than happy right. by the way you mm -hmm. are like literally one of the first people that uh mm -hmm. i had like a very um tidy oh, i would i forgot the word in english like tidy uh like a not professional conversation but like something tidy you know like clean like and all well that prepared. yeah uh, yeah something like that all right so i'll begin my 12 minutes on explaining my case here so yeah. with that i would like to you know again thank you for this conversation but the main thing that i do want to at least go over is at least what i would refer to at the moment uh the issue about what i would call the five points that get to the heart of the discussion or at least six if we do get to divine simplicity so the first one is what do we call the transcendental argumentation for the christian worldview that's the, ultimately the main thing that i'm trying to present here in terms of what would be the case for christianity and at the same time what would then be referred to as um, the refutation of islam or what therefore keeps me from coming to islam is due to a certain particular uh set of questions that are behind uh the reasoning and the notions and the thoughts of this so the transcendental argument while transcendental uh, argumentation has been around with uh emmanuel kant the one that i'm utilizing mostly stems from that of cornelius van til uh, as well as mostly within this van tilian sense of frame but this is one that a friend of mine formulated in a syllogistic sense so regarding my particular what? argument Do, uh, oh, sorry, so regarding my particular argument it is essentially premise one if intelligibility did not exist we would not be able to argue that intelligibility does not exist intelligibility in this case being that which is um the concept about being able to ha see things and understand things that are fully comprehensible uh to the human perception premise two intelligibility exists premise three christianity exhaustively provides both the metaphysical and the epistemological grounds for intelligibility metaphysical being uh that which is the philosophical study of reality and epistemological being the grounds on basically dealing with knowledge so it provides the grounds for intelligibility from the perspective of reality as well as 
on the accountability of knowledge. P- premise four, any deviation whatsoever from Christianity no longer exhaustively provides both the metaphysical and epistemological grounds for intelligibility. Premise five, if intelligibility is true, Christianity is true. The conclusion, or the therefore, in this particular syllogism, is that Christianity is true. Now, while this may be a syllogistic argument, the main way to bring this about is to deal with the particular means to justify why this is the case. And so for that, I do want to go over a particular bit of information. Before I get to another syllogistic argument, I would like to at least touch on the doctrine of Tawhid in its relation to predestination, though again, the doctrine of Tawhid is going to be brought up in several parts of my critique on Islam, or rather the questions that I have that are therefore preventing me on it. With the doctrine of Tawhid, or that is Unitarianism theology, in regards to predestination or Qadr, as it is known in Islam, I believe that these combination of ideas formed together, especially with therefore the Unitarian notion of God being the highlight or the primary doctrine, this renders the predestination doctrine to a form of theological fatalism, which is a problem that's been discussed with philosophers at least since the time of Augustine regarding whether divine omniscience is compatible with the doctrine of free will. As a compatibilist, I would certainly affirm this and think that the Trinity would be in line with this as well. Um, But with that only reason that I would say that is because this form makes God interacting with other human beings with that that which has been predestined but in terms of Islam there is the idea that all things have been written on eternal tablets or tablets because apparently I've been found out there's some dispute on whether the tablets are eternal but regardless the point is before creation began to exist you had these tablets that have everything written on them of what will happen from the beginning to the very end and that there can be nothing that can be done about it and with that all god did for the predestination is to simply write these things and then let them come to be without really much interaction with the creation unless of course sins usually the angels um in the deal there whereas in the trinitarian notion of things god predestines things and in the sense of starting with the father and then the son can interact with the creation as well as even the spirit who is in the in the spirits of the believers at that point so that would be one of my particular arguments there um islam as i would point out fails to account for the logical problem of the one and the many which is the problem regarding the existence and the language accounting for universals and particulars, such as, for example, there's apple as a universal, and then a particular apple uh, could be the notion of the particular among those universals that contain the property of appleness. Same thing, therefore, with an apple as a particular regarding uh, redness, because certain apples contain that particular property and thus would fit within that particular category but with this diversity of unity and yet plurality or particularity the problem becomes a very interesting one regarding our knowledge and meaning of language and in fact dr uh, bosserman in his book the trinity and the vindication of christian paradox as well as james n anderson in his works has pointed out that this is a very important philosophical problem Uh, And it was certainly such for Van Til as he would write in his particular works on the matter as it deals with several things regarding us being able to account for rational categories and doing them justice uh, based on what particular view we hold to on which takes priority. For Plato was the one that affirmed the one over the many that ultimately universals take the precedence. But then you have Aristotle saying that the many take the precedence. And if you examine the only philosophers that I'm aware of that at least discuss this in Islam, such as Al-Kindi, Ibn Sina, Al-Farabi, mainly the arguments seem to be going towards a notion uh, of sort of the one over many thing, especially within the notion of Al-Kindi with his concept of the one that he eventually borrowed from Neoplatonist uh, philosophy. 
um, that this is essentially that particular thing. And as I mentioned, there's a problem with that because ultimately it states that there is an abstract universal and therefore we can have to observe that that's the ultimate. But the problem is we can only get that from the particulars and therefore there's the question, as it's been stated, that therefore this universal is not real but rather is just what we are abstracting from the particulars. And even Plato himself knew the error of this um, whole idea. So there is problems with the notion of Islam where it ultimately has to go to a one, where ultimately it has to therefore state that this abs this universal doesn't really actually exist because it's therefore borrowing an abstract from something. Um, but also it would then make unity only thing that's true and particulars or diversity um, an illusion at that point. So there would be an issue that therefore would happen within the scope and the realm of Islam at that point, whereas the Trinity focuses on the equal ultimacy of the one and the many, meaning there is no choosing on that because God is a concrete universal where God is ultimately one and yet ultimately many in that sense. So therefore giving any account for the meaning of university and yet diversity in not just simply philosophical means, but even that of uh, political and various other different means in which we can see these particular notions. Another issue that I pointed out is regarding the problem of epistemological certainty in light of Surah 4, Ayah 157, which is the famous verse that states that they thought they crucified Jesus the Messiah, uh, but they did not crucify him, nor did they kill him. But the part that I'm focusing on is not if did Jesus actually get crucified, but rather is the part where it says it was made to appear so and the consensus regardless of what particular position one affirms on what exactly happened to jesus is that the notion that jesus himself was appeared or given somewhat of an illusion um or deception to appear as if he died so that some things could happen such as that he appeared to have died in a fainting sense so that way he could live and then uh, leave. This is known as the swoon theory. There's those that think that Jesus was eventually uh, taken to heaven uh, on the cross as a result before they could actually kill him and there was just given an illusion to make it look like he was still there. Or there was someone that had the body such as usually Judas. This is the substitution theory of it. But regardless of each position, they give ultimately questions on a philosophical meaning on epistemological certainty. That is, how can we know what we are experiencing is actually real such as the old days with descartes on knowing if what he was experiencing was real whenever he was trying to be certain of his particular ideas so with that for example how can i know that i'm actually holding a can uh drink in my hand and not something else i may look at it and see it like such but what if it is a particular thing that i am not too certain of, and it's only based off an illusion either due to brain chemistry that I may have or in this particular case something that for whatever reason necessary uh, God decides to put a particular illusion of it so possibly that maybe I don't freak out at what I'm holding um, in actuality or maybe it's because of something other than that so it brings about the question of can we be certain on an epistemological level of what we know we are observing or interacting with or looking at is actually that is actually real and not just that but even other historical events such as for example the assassination of uh abraham lincoln we know that from what we have in the history that you know he was assassinated uh from someone in a theater but with that how can we know that uh, that actually happened based on not just simply our looking at it, but even from the people who observed it. How can we tell that they were people that could be certain of what they were seeing or experiencing was actually true, that this is actually what happened to Lincoln instead of something else? I got a lot more points to go over, but I'll do that during the question part, since that is the end of my time there. Um... So with that, as I mentioned, uh, I'll go for about 30 minutes to let you ask some uh, questions or make some clarification points. Uh, so you may begin uh, with your 30 minutes now. Uh, I 
actually just uh, because I want to understand how will this go the next yeah. 30 minutes. So should I like um, reply to your points or should you ask me questions or like should I ask you questions or like what? Yeah, I'll be asking you ask me questions as well as, you know, you uh, can also uh, mention some clarifications if you want before asking a question. So that way, if you feel I might misunderstand something during the whole deal, then you're more than welcome but you got like 30 minutes which i believe is plenty of time on on that unless you want yeah. 35 <laughs> uh, it's fine it's fine okay uh all right so uh basically first of uh, all let's uh, talk about al qadr and uh how you actually understand it uh, so wrong so basically imagine with me a teacher who teaches uh, students for a whole year and then at the end of the year before the exams or after the mock exams etc whatever uh, he would say to the students, hey, you're going to pass. Hey, you're going to get the first in the class. Hey, you're going to uh, fail. And then when the results come out, exactly what the teacher said, like that, for, that student got the first, that student got the second, and that student uh, failed, uh, happened. And then uh, uh, the reason is, it's not, uh, was it because the students listened to the teacher that they have this effect? No, it's it's uh, across their free will, but because the teacher knows them so well that he expected this to happen, and then uh, it happened. And then mm -hmm. with the qadr, this is exactly the case. With Allah, Zawajal, we also assume, uh, since God, he's a God, he's an absolute. And then one of the things that he's absolute at is ex expectation, you know, and like he actually knows everything since he has the absolute knowledge. And so he knows what each person is going to do. And then when someone, and then he writes it. And then when someone actually does it, it's no surprise that God uh, expected it to happen. However, now there are things that we want to mention. And that is, how does a dua change free will? Or sorry, change qadr? Uh, I think you didn't ask this question, but usually people uh, generally ask this question. How does a dua change qadr? And the answer is very easy. God does know what is happening, what will happen if something that did not happen and uh, what will not happen you know all these kinds of things and then what happens is that let's say i expected to do something but then someone else made dua for me or like prayed for me and then that prayer god answers it and changes my fate to that you see so that's that's something like a uh, inter uh, uh like like let's say these kinds of things happening so uh, allah Zijal also mentioned that this qadr has changed However, now if you ask me, where is everything written on? It's certain in a hidden book. It's called the Lawh al-Mahfuz. We don't know what's written there. We don't know if expectations are written there or anything. Now, but for that, the things that Allah Azzawajal actually wrote, you know, they are changed and they are uh, like, just as Allah Azzawajal said, that they are uh, like, uh, uh, can be changed. However, now this is also is another question. Some people would say, okay, still like Allah Azzawajal expects me to do this and that. Aren't everything I'm doing is according to Allah Azza wa uh, expectation? The answer is yes, but that's not an excuse. And uh, the reason is Allah Azza wa said that we have the choice of five things and uh, we are enforced on three things. And what are the three things that we are enforced on? The parents, we don't choose our parents. The time we were born, we don't choose where we were born. And uh, something else also regarding our birth, I forgot. Uh, so these are the three things that are predetermined that we cannot change, but we are free to change everything else. So that was the first point uh, regarding Qadr. Do you have any questions uh, regarding that? Um, not really. I mean, well, maybe I'll get to those though. They're in my particular question time, but like you know, this is the oh, well, so yeah. like yeah, it, yeah, I'll ask mine during my. I should my ask deal. you in my time. <laughs> yeah, but like this is also just oh, in case okay, you want to okay. ask okay. Uh, I clarifications. Oh, the other way around. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I thought no, you're I good. the other way around. <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So uh, now with the second thing about intelligibility and like uh, logic in general. Yeah. Um, of course, if uh, logic exists, then God exists because God created logic. Uh, however, I think that you kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, didn't also uh, figure out how does Trion have a logical factor? Because let's say that there is a God that has a will and then other, another God that has another will. Mm -hmm. And then a third God, which is the free Holy Spirit that has the will of people. Mm -hmm. Now, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. If we would call a god, if we would call a god a an absolute, yeah, all right, an absolute of everything, wouldn't having the one and many as parts of God be uh, claiming that God is not actually an absolute because some parts of God are also uh, the rest of the universe? However, with uh, claiming that there is only one God, only one, and like mm -hmm. uh, nothing is shared to anyone else, we know that the whole power is to the one, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't even understand why the one and the many is a big issue. It's actually a not viable argument, in my opinion. It's like, uh, I mean, who, who would also like, imagine, imagine you're the best doctor in your like field, and then mm -hmm. another person would suggest something else and that thing uh, does matter to your opinion mm -hmm. and it turns out that it can also be something wrong while if you have decided it on your own you would have gotten it totally right and that's that is exactly what will happen when we talk about this, the absolute someone who's an absolute doesn't need to be shared doesn't need to be uh parts mm -hmm. and doesn't need to actually uh, have different uh, views so mm -hmm. like the one and, and many in my opinion i don't see that it's a problem i think it's a a flawed statement that uh, would actually need people to verify why mm -hmm. does a one and many have like um, uh, like a problem with an existing of God because I think yeah maybe it is applicable and everything because we all need water for example and we are all, all built up from water just like God explained mm -hmm. but then God is the exception God is not built from water right. God is the creator of water just mm -hmm. like a car maker how would a car like a car has shared parts so that makes it a car. But then where does the car maker fit inside? Mm -hmm. He doesn't, you know? Mm -hmm. These are the things that uh, right. are regarding the one and the many. Uh, well, what uh, are the other things that... Well, if I may answer on that particular one there. Yeah, please, um, please. Number one, the one of the many doesn't necessarily talk about like that of composition but rather that of what something can be referred to as and if our language on it is therefore meaningful you mentioned a car um the issue with the problem with the one of the many is not if it is a car that is then made from certain particular parts that are the many but rather that an individual car such as a honda car a nissan car a chevrolet car uh how do we know that they have something in common, that they're related to each other, and which we do already apply that, as you mentioned, the term car. There's different cars out there, but there's a way that we then st still call them the same term, and that is that they are part of the universal of carness um, in that part. So that's the issue there, because, and the reason why it's significant is if it's meaningful, because again, if one only affirms that the universal is ultimate over the many, the particulars, then ultimately this states that therefore the universal is what actually is true, and therefore the many is an illusion, and therefore we can only refer to something as car. We cannot ever refer to something as a specific type of car. Because, therefore, that isn't an actual thing. There are no actual particular right. parts or different parts of different kinds of cars. Such may as I cars. ask? Mm -hmm. Or actually, may I answer your uh, your question with the, uh, your answer? Like, I have a, like a perfect I mean, answer. I mean, yeah, say. sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, and the story of Adam, how did we identify that he's a human and he was the only human? Because there were of, no many. Yeah. Well, the issue with so, that. So, that's the that's the first thing like we yeah. actually base on criteria first of all things that make someone a someone or i think a thing that's what mm -hmm. we call yeah and also the one and the many was also addressed in the story of adam salam, when god told him and taught him to name things hey that's a ship that's a land that's a sheep right that's a something right and then naming things doesn't even require the one and the many at all but then a more important question mm -hmm. why why would a god which is an absolute mm -hmm. fall for some mere logical theory that can be challenged okay so because i was still trying to answer the other one so let me have a chance to explain ask yeah. uh, or answer all these uh, questions you also asked as well so regarding that and i would agree that you know god gives an account for the issue of the one and the many with that especially with adam being the only one the issue is on notion even if adam is just the only human being it's not about having other human beings there to therefore come to this particular conclusion um 
because there would be even other things uh, at that point that you would still have to deal with regarding universality and plurality. And that is regarding the notions of rocks, uh, different types of uh, plants or grass, different kinds of trees, different kinds of fruit, all these particular things which were certainly made before Adam at that point. So that would be the deal on that. And again, the issue is... And again, it's a problem that is sort of overlooked even by today's philosophical um, people. But back in the day when it was being addressed by the uh, Socratics as well as eventually within the 20th century by certain philosophers such as Bertrand Russell and Van Til, it was definitely seen as a very significant uh, philosophical thing that deals with a lot of issues we don't tend to think about um, such as the issue of our knowledge of things and accounting for it as well as using words that have actual meaning and value uh, for example there's people out there that will say uh, that if the one is over the many and that universal uh, is greater that unity is greater than particularity at that point you could then have the statement that referring to people as either male or female or black white brown yellow or the other different uh, colors that are usually uh, represented in history that could be then said these don't actually exist and they are social constructs we've made up we are human we are not male and female we are not white brown uh, black, red, any of these particular terms. We aren't any of these things. Um, so these would be concepts um, that are discussed. But again, if you have a certain thing that can actually give a logical, consistent account, that's the main particular uh, thing on that. And you asked about the Trinity and how it's logical in light of the one and the many. The issue is that with God as an absolute, he is one and many, one in essence or being and many in persons um so and because of that that doesn't mean therefore there are three gods um on our view the issue is because if it was three beings or three essences that would certainly result in tritheism or uh different gods but because of the person and being distinction which we can at least observe with the notion of you being a human being uh, but the individual person you are is distinct from the human being, such as for me, I am a human being, but I am RC apologist. That is the person of which makes me distinct at that point from any particular other human being at that point. So that would be the notion that brings about such a classical distinction within philosophical terms. Um, and I'm trying to, if you could recap what your last question was, because I'm trying to remember it. Yes, so you actually mentioned a distinction, uh, which is exactly what uh, what is my last question leads to. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was a distinction between absolutes, like imagine a highest truth. If there were a distinction between the three highest truths, wouldn't that be uh, like an immediate disproof of having something absolute? Like you would have to explain what you mean by the three truths yes. that you mentioned. So for example... For example, if they were like both of them, like the father and mm -hmm. the son, are both the highest intellectual people, right? Or like the gods, you yeah. know? Yeah, the absolute like uh, strength, the absolute smartness, the absolute etc. Yeah. Why would they have distinction? Mm -hmm. We know that absolute leads to one thing. Yeah. And then that's the major flaw of the one and many. It's just like, hey, if we have an Adam. And he was only one thing for a specific period of time. What? What would? And he's a creation, not a creator. What's the matter of having a creator for all of the amounts of time to be one and not mm -hmm. having many? There is mm -hmm. no real issue of that. Well, the issue that I would have on the Unitarian uh, notion of things, uh, but before I get into that particular uh, deal, what I would point out is there would be distinctions because they would be proper and basic with that because it'd be the same thing for example if asking you know are the attributes of god um regarding christianity or islam if these things are absolute attributes uh, that god has yet we make distinctions between attributes such as the concept of love of a loving god of a forgiving god omniscience 
uh, omnipresence, these certain particular attributes exist and are multiple with God, but yet we make proper distinctions regarding, therefore, those particular notions. Um, so with that, uh, my particular deal is what I call the deductive argument against Unitarianism, which um, states essentially that in the first bit of things, all things formed must be formed by reasoning causes for our beliefs about them to be rational. Uh, then all things formed must ultimately be formed by only one reasoning cause for our beliefs about them to be rational. I think you would, I would agree with the first two parts of these starting premises that they must be formed by reasoning causes for our beliefs about them to be rational. And it has to be only one reasoning cause in essence for them to be rational. God would then have to conceive of himself as his own reason that is comprehend and have himself being understood to be that very reason as the cause of all things that exist and then finally it would be that therefore then divinity is shared in any rational god and if god conceives of himself as his own reason he can he shares that divinity with himself and the god conceived thereof that is conceived by god so that's where I would point with that. And I'd say in Unitarianism, um, it cannot explain or have divinity being shared in any rational God. So again, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what, uh, sorry for cutting you off. Oh, you're good. Like, uh, oh, um, uh, again, like the more you actually explain to it, the more it doesn't even make sense, uh, sense and has more flaws. Because if we look at physics, just physics, for example, which yeah. is a creation of God, the physical laws, we know that physics changes according to times and uh, speeds of universes, different universes, different places. How do we guarantee that all physics laws and biology laws would be the same one meter outside of our universe? We cannot. And then how did we come to the claim that the science of philosophy should apply exactly one meter ahead outside the universe of our creation? It doesn't have to be. What has to be, though, is that the things that are portrayed to us by God should make a whole logical sense. For example, one of the most illogical things that uh, Christianity or sorry, sorry, like let's let's actually move on, because this is I, I still don't think that there is a problem. I think that there is a problem with the theory itself, you know, because mm -hmm. um, if we look more on the theory of the one and the many. And this is also something to actually um, prove that the idea of having a one and many in a god is not obsolete. How can a god kill himself or get killed? Mm -hmm. And then if he did get killed indeed, and he is a god, mm -hmm. and he is the thing that must be praised the most, mm -hmm. isn't killing an immortal lifts all the weight of ha having a sacrifice it's not even a sacrifice if he's coming back the whole idea of having a sacrifice is uh, to not actually come back and this is the, then uh, what you actually raised against me you know, the, the point uh, that says that the, uh, you know um, how do we actually verify that uh, God raised him to the sky not to, not actually killed and then the answer is it's obvious because the Jewish themselves, they saw that God, uh, that uh, they didn't kill Jesus. And uh, some of the disciples also saw it. And so they also know that they killed someone else. And that's why they were ly lying. So it's not really about hey, not addressing anyone. No, uh, Islam, I told you, uh, the Holy Quran always addressed all types of people. And mm -hmm. then the first people that they were to address are the people who actually did this. You know, the the people who saw the whole, whole thing happening in, in front of them. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it, it be illogical if the Holy Quran didn't even mention this thing at first? It, let's let's put it for, for like let's say let's not even claim that this was the right incident. If someone was to claim uh -huh. that he's a true religion prophet. Yeah. Wouldn't it make the most logical sense to actually mention this at the very beginning? Well, regarding that, um, 
that would be a question not just simply regarding the Trinity, regarding mentioning a specific set of doctrines, but at that point, several other different concepts um, that are in Christian theology, and hence why these particular debates therefore exist within different religions among different doctrines that is uh, usually had and stated, uh, for example. Um, like, for example, there's the Trinity, and then there's some that try to disagree with it. There's also doc uh, issues about predestination and what actually that entails. There's also, f funny enough, ever since the existence of the process theism or open theistic uh, notions of God as opposed to classical theism, you have people saying, is God truly omniscient or is his omniscience limited? Um, that's at least the claim of the uh, open theist in that regard. Um, but it's not just simply that. I mean, for example, we talked about the tablets and just to kind of ask a question for the sake of mentioning the point, you do you affirm that the tablets that predestined this thing were eternal or uh, created? Oh, of course God created them. Okay, so there's people that affirm the createdness of it, and this goes to not just apparently some... Um, no, uh, the only the only book that is uh, like a, uh, what do you call it, words of God is mm -hmm. actually Holy Quran. Right, but I'm, talk like but I'm talking about the... Books. Right, but I'm talking about like the before uh, Muhammad was given the revelation and all that sort of stuff. That was the tablets that are in heaven. Uh, so you'd affirm those were created. Oh yeah, yeah. Like okay. they, they're they're not like ta uh, tablets. It's just a, a book. Right. That well, God wrote everything well, in it. Well, the term that is used in the Arabic as thus is what's translated in some of the Qurans is what is referred to as the tablets. Um, and people. Uh, in most of Sunni theology, from what I've observed and the scholars in the writing have said that this is eternal tablets um, that have existed with Allah since the beginning on the notion, but then you'd have certain uh, No, actually, in... actually, to disprove this is that the first thing that Allah Azzajal created before even the books themselves, mm -hmm. he created the arsh or the, the chair that he sits on. Yeah. He actually created that. And then right. he created the pen or the pen or like the thing to write on yeah and then with that he wrote these things so these are also clear creation right but at the same time that and this is what i'm getting my point at is while you say that most of the sunnis if stated that it is eternal tablets while as certain shari types as well as the mutazillas especially with the mutazilla controversy um they were the ones that were stating that the tablets were created because if the tablets were eternal, therefore, that would be saying there is something with a similar attribute as God, therefore, associating partners. And people were definitely having disputes about this, including Ibn Hanbal, who debated with um, the Mutazilla people on this particular issue. So there was debate on this particular topic of it, and it's not the only one. There's definitely been others yes. that still go on today, such as are the at or things like the the foot or the hands of Allah are they actually real or metaphorical? Um, this is what usually brings about the distinction among the Athari and the Ashari RC, schools. I think, uh, sorry to cut you off. I'm yeah, yeah. very sorry, but no, uh, RC, I think you are actually mixing up with the three things, not even one or two. Um, the first thing is that about Ibn Hanbal when he did discussed. Uh, the tablets, mm -hmm. uh, they were not tablets, it was the Holy Quran, and the whole incident was called the Khalq al Quran. And basically, they were discussing whether, and even the Mu'tazila and these people, they were discussing whether the Holy Quran in itself is a creation or not. And all this debate, uh, we all say that, even as a Sunni, I say that no, the Holy Quran is an eternal, that's the word of God. However, now this is the thing. What is not eternal is the tablets of Qadr. So these are the two differences, and these are two very different things. And all Sunnis agree that the Holy Quran is not a, uh, a creation, it is an eternal. Mm -hmm. So with this, like, I think the whole point of discussion there falls, you know? Well, the issue, like, again, it's not just simply of... It wasn't just simply on the issue of just simply the Quran. Sure, that was the discussion, but it was about where the Quran ultimately comes from. That was being what, and I might not pronounce this correctly, but the La al Mafuz, uh, which in the Arabic refers to the preserved tablet yes. in Surah 85. Yeah. And with that, that's what was being discussed was the preserved tablets. And if they were eternal, which seemed to have been the traditional view based on what is written in the scholarly literature, literature from 
scholars as well as the hadiths and other things but <laughs> then you'd have the mutazilla comes in that said these particular tablets were created they all agree that the quran at least the ones you have uh, in your possession is created in the sense that you know it had to come from paper and then all that kind of stuff but then there's the source of the quran being from god that was then put into the tablets whenever he told the pen to write um on the tablets so that's what i'm referring to and what they're referring to that there is a deal about the tablets and that that yeah. so, mm -hmm. so the, the love and mahfud is also i thought i actually talked about it previously and i said to you that this is something that people don't even know what's even written there yeah and then there's also another thing that is about that predetermination that god wrote about like what's happening the qadr. yep now these are three different things they're not the same thing um First of all, about the Holy Quran in itself, yes, it is the the incident of Khalq al-Quran, which the, the whole point of it wasn't even Allah al-Mahfud. The whole point of it was to prove that the Holy Quran was a creation or not. Mm -hmm. And this is where, uh, like, the whole point of discussion at that period, at the whole period, not just with the, with the with the Ibn Hanbal, like, uh, it's it's literally the whole Islamic period at that time when the people from philosophical Greek. They came, and then Ibn Hanbal actually defeated them in the arguments. Mm -hmm. Now, the second thing that I wanted to mention, uh, actually, actually, yeah, you can continue. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify this. Like, this is a very huge matter to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think I've like kind of mentioned my deal, but all I'll say is, and before, because you got about four minutes on your deal, I'll just simply say that my point was simply to point out that we affirm that these doctrines are found in our scriptures. So, you know, the Trinity in the Bible, I even say within the Old Testament uh, as well for the Trinity, since I affirm that's a doctrine that's regarding God being Trinitarian eternally and thus even within that point. Um, but there's debate on it because some people disagree on it. Just like, for example, there are people who disagree and will say that the tablets were eternal, the tablets were created. Um, that still goes on today just uh, in several other issues among not just simply uh, smaller things with the creeds of Sunni Islam, but Sunnis versus Shia, Sunni versus Ahmadiyya, Shia versus Ahmadiyya, and various other debates on people that will say that this is what uh, they believe is found in it. Um, and then them asking the same kind of question, why wasn't this particular wording found in there um, from the very beginning? So it's those particular uh, things that I wanted to point out. All right. So actually, uh, one more thing, because uh, I only have three minutes left before yep. uh, your turn. So mm -hmm. I'd like to mention also my other points. So I spent a lot of time talking about logical order and the perfect law uh, and about the physical evidences. And right now, even like as the result of these 30 minutes, mm -hmm. I would still hold on actually even more to my opinion. And you probably will hold on to your opinion mm -hmm. because these are reasons. But then... Mm -hmm. When a physical evidence shows up, this is where like uh, wording and talking stops, you know, like uh, just like the court case, uh, a lawyer says, hey, why would my defendant do this? He wouldn't have to do this because he, he will lose. He will do everything. And then when a camera footage and a fingerprint shows up, all, all words just disappear. And this is why I wanted to mention like, hey, uh, we talked about a very small factor. Mm -hmm. That is also debatable and will be still debatable. But we didn't talk about the most important thing, which is the proof. If anyone would come to you, you wouldn't talk to him like someone who wants to learn about any religion. You wouldn't talk to him about, hey, just like that, that and like theories. And let's bring to you what the Greeks said and like these kinds of things. No, I will actually prove to you that I am with God. I am a prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And then I have to prove to you that I am a prophet. So I'll bring a miracle in front of you. Mm -hmm. And then this is, I think, the main thing that we should address. What are the miracles of Christianity that till today will prove to me that Christianity is the true religion? Mm -hmm. Especially that it didn't even address all the types of people like the atheists or like other ideologists or like even Muslims at our time, which are mm -hmm. a very big uh, slice of people like throughout history after like four, 700 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I would argue that the notion of dealing with certain particular religions is found there even if necessarily they didn't exist for example you see in psalm 14 1 the fool says in his heart there is no god that already right there just simply brings up the issue about atheists who would say there is no god and therefore what the bible would describe their particular reasoning as and then you see the same similar kind of thing in romans 1 as well 
regarding the one who has the natural inclination of God and yet the foolishness that it happens whenever they reject God. Um, so there are several things which can be applied to things that we're dealing with nowadays that is still found in, within the Bible. Um, but regarding the proof on miracles, and again, we don't just examine proofs on brute proofs, meaning that they're just simply that, but rather we also come with a philosophy or an interpretation of these facts or proofs um, that exist. Same thing within the concept at that point of miracles. So these the concepts of miracles can be resided with, you know, uh, Muhammad did this as a prophet through the means of uh, God. But then the question becomes which God and therefore is that particular God able to exist on the basis of being rational uh, cause at that point. And my whole argument has been that even if Muhammad did receive miracles on that, according to the particular account, it would be on the issue that God that the God that's presented the Unitarian notion is one that cannot logically consist given what I would refer to as the particular premises that would thus make it impossible to be Unitarian to begin with. Um, so that would be uh, the time on that. I would then go with the 30 minutes to ask you some questions real quick. Sure, sure. Take all right. Time. So, all right. So going off with the start of it. So you mentioned that the, at one point during your you know statement, that there was no change in wording like that. So when you say that, um, so do you mean that all all the different ver uh, types of manuscripts or um, works that are out there of translations, or even not just translations? Um, I'm, well, I mean, definitely there'd be some difference in translation. But the issue about the kirat, you'd say that there's no difference in words for these particular things. Okay, yeah. So this is this is the very important uh, thing that you actually brought up, which is the Qiraat and the are 10. Actually, there are 14, but then uh, four are uh, deleted because of uh, things that uh, there are the criteria. Yeah. So with uh, drawing the Holy Quran, there are four main criteria that a uh, Qiraat should uh, actually submit to, so it can be considered as a Sahih Qiraat. I don't recall them very, uh, very correctly, but... But, and this is something uh, that is also a proof that, uh, alhamdulillah, the Holy Quran hasn't been changed, is, is that, um, I will say, first of all, uh, there are four things, which is first, that they should uh, uh, be read with the original letters of the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. Like, when, when you, uh, by the way, do you know how uh, Holy Quran is written? Or like the Arabic language is written? Have you know, uh, have you studied the letters of Arabic? Not entirely the study of the letters of Arabic, but I've at least read works where people have brought up the particular mentioning of the history of the Quran in the Arabic language over the period of time uh, regarding the history yes. of the Quranic text. Yes. So basically, if you look at the Arabic text uh, before, uh, like previously, the Arabic text uh, text was written like, if you l listen to the letters, ba, ta, tha, these three letters are actually written as one in Arabic language. Yeah. And then what will happen is that uh, at the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, where actually people uh, from uh, different uh, nations and different uh, uh, languages would come to be Muslim, they would struggle to read the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he was the first one to actually um, uh, point the Holy Quran. However, all uh, Arabs would uh, also be memorizing the Holy Quran at that time. So right. they would also memorize it by the 10 uh, Qira'ah mm -hmm. and they would also memorize it with the t uh, with where to, do they pause and where do they not pause. Mm -hmm. And so this is even more proof that more people actually learn the Holy Quran and that the chain is actually bigger than what, when we think, than what we think of. Okay. So regarding that then, so for example, and this is all based off the translation from, I believe it's, uh, uh, it's from what is written, referred to or called as the Bridges translation of the Ten Kirat uh, by Dr. Sal from uh, Salimon uh, regarding translating the Quran and then providing footnotes that mention particular differences in reading in, among the different Ten Kirat. Um, so while there's things like Master and king as a variant in surah 14 that's usually brought up um that can you uh, tell me what is the name of the surah just so i can open the the quran very quickly surah 1 is the very first chapter uh and it's the fourth verse so which were 
Surah Yep, that's you because that's usually where people cite uh, yes. regarding this particular issue because the issue is on, you know, in one of them it says, you know, referring to Allah as the master of the day of recompense. Um, but then in the Bridges translation, there's the reference that says, quote, all except for Asem, Al Qasai, Yaqub, and Kalaf, in one of the narrations, reads as the king of the day of recompense. Now, these are synonymous. Mm -hmm. Um, but they are still different um, words at that point because one refers to master, one refers to king. But I mean, you know, I think we pretty much get the idea of what both of these terms would basically entail at that point that makes them synonymous. Um, so that's the deal here. And, and mind you, I'm not trying to use these to say that therefore there is some kind of problem with the Quran because as I've learned in my discussions with Muslims that they pretty much accepted this and don't see it as a problem and I have to agree because it's similar to the notion of textual variance within the Bible where again there may be different words but there are synonyms that don't change the overall meaning or the message of the Quran because another one if you want to go to it is Surah 2 verse 10 uh, yes uh, could you read that one for me uh, I have a scenario and are you able to translate that or at least uh, provide what you believe the meaning of the message of that is uh, it's like um, they are like heart sick mm -hmm. so uh, Allah Azzawajal increased their heart uh, okay uh, I'm bad at translation but like a heart and sickness mm -hmm. and they would have like a bad punishment and uh, like a hurtful like a painful punishment mm -hmm. uh, for what they have been lying about. Right. So um, one of the deals there you mentioned is lying, and that's in the translation that was provided by Suleiman that there's a painful punishment on account of how they used to lie. Um, and is noted in the variant reading from Suleiman that states from Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amir, Ibn Ammar, Abu Jafar, and Yaqub read it as they used to disbelieve. Um, so in the one that you have present, there is the notion of they used to lie. And another one, it reads as they used to disbelieve. Now, this is basically a difference on the means of the punishment that's painful on account of something. So there's the idea of lying, mm -hmm. but then there's the idea of disbelief. Now, these are definitely different words, but again, the concept could still be, because um, I believe there's a, in the top zero of a verse uh, from Ibn Kathir, because that was one of the readers that was mentioned that says it's they used to disbelieve it mentioned he states the the hypocrites have two characteristics they lie and they deny the unseen so basically it's just differences and citing basically what is considered therefore the characteristic of the hypocrite and that it's the hypocrite that is the subject of that particular verse um mm -hmm. but the but the point is that i'm making it this because i don't want to because i got several more examples of these particular things on here yeah, yeah, but sure, sure. but but i think you understand my point that ultimately I, and even others would have said from my discussion, never say there is no change in word uh, from the Quran, but rather there is no change in the meaning or the message uh, regarding at least the Qurans we have now. But when we say there is no change in like word or all that, that's what we refer to then that eternal tablet in which the Quran is written upon at that point, because hence why it was also called, uh, when we mentioned the Arabic for that, the preserved tablet, because, you know, God himself preserved the tablet right particularly there. Um, but that's all I just wanted to mention and clarify, and what, if that's what you meant by uh, no change, even in light of the Qurat. I just wanted to understand your particular uh, point. Actually, with the Qurat, so Prophet Sallallahu there was a story of Umar bin Khattab just uh, learning a story, uh, learning a surah, from Prophet Sallallahu and then another person was learning another surah, like the same surah, yeah. by another qara'ah. And then during the prayer, Umar ibn Khattab was praying behind that guy, and he was Imam. And then uh, that Imam was like reading the Holy Quran, and Umar ibn Khattab was listening it to, uh, like it was totally wrong, and he was just learning it from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was so angry, but he kept kept calm. And then he went to him, it's like, hey, you're an infidel, come here, like I'll go, like, bring you to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually uh, came to him. And then uh, he said, like, look, he's reading the Holy Quran wrong. And like, listen to him. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam listened to him reading. And then uh, when he was listening to him, he was like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, continue. Like, he was actually listening to that guy reciting. Yeah. And then Ahmad Khattab actually 
felt uh, insecure about his uh, thing. So he started reading the Holy Quran and like Prophet ﷺ was also listening to him. And then this is the proof that actually the Holy Quran was uh, uh, taught by 10 different Qiraat without any change in words, you know? Like the words of the Qiraat changes, but like there's no editing in that. And then you would say, okay, then how do we have actually different words? Well, actually, this is also one of the more of a miracle also of the Holy Quran, which, approved, which also uh, proves its accuracy, is that the other words and other Qiraat will all actually describe the incidents and so mm -hmm. it will actually describe it even more accurately mm -hmm. all right then so uh then my next uh question then goes to you mentioned the scientific miracles uh the scientific miracle point on the quran which i haven't heard in quite some time but i do want to ask and mention are you familiar with a uh apologist by the name of hamza uh, sortis well, sources i'm sure uh, see if i'm i i think i think i think yeah i've heard of him he, he's a muslim right yes he's a muslim uh apologist who wrote a uh famous um uh, book on the topic dealing with uh atheism because uh, i remember there was even a person that did a whole s a course that centered around um the book that he wrote it was called the divine reality god islam and the mirage of atheism um, it's a popular book that I believe is free as a PDF online because it's pretty much because he deals a lot with atheism. Um, but uh -huh. but he did write an essay a while back on this uh, thing about the Quran containing scientific miracles. But and mind you, this is from the Muslim where he states uh, in his newer essay on the Quran: Does the Quran contain scientific miracles? A new approach. He says, regrettably, the scientific miracles narrative has become an intellectual embarrassment for Muslim apologists, including myself and then he mentions when he published the paper trying to point out the uh miracles scientific miracles in the quran um he stated himself that he then when quote when the paper was published it was pu placed under a microscope by atheist activists although they misrepresented some of the points they raised some significant contentions i have since removed the paper from my website in retrospect if this never happened i probably wouldn't be writing this essay now um so he mentions and mind you person who used to believe that there was scientific miracles in the quran whereas it mentioned you know he they knew this stuff before you know like all this other scientific knowledge would eventually mention or come about but he mentions that this argument relies on six problems that make it problematic and incoherent one is relies on the fallacy of the, in, the undistributed middle number two mm -hmm. um it represents inaccurate history which as he mentions in an interview on this that's available on youtube he gives examples where he as he mentioned in disagreement with you on it was that there are the there are the greeks that actually did have identical accurate information uh with what the quran would specifically state on the matter on it uh, number three is the teleology of the quranic verses um the fourth problem being what does, mm -hmm. what does uh theology mean so according to him on uh, the teology te teleology he says quote the entire scientific miracle narrative seems to ignore or overlook the main theological objectives of the verses the verses were revealed as signposts mm -hmm. to reflect and come to the conclusion that god is one and that he alone deserves to be worshipped so what he means by that is that those that usually try to state that um they are scientific miracles uh ignore the theological significance of the verses which i think he mostly definitely refers to that with what i've had my experience interacting with some quran only muslims that try to view it as a book of science and not as a book of the supernatural um but the fourth issue mentions is that ultimately this gets one to adopt the philosophy of scientism or the problem of induction and empiricism um mm -hmm. he also mentions as he admits and states there are quote unscientific unquote verses this is his particular words um and i know he does gives examples in his essay and then the final one is mir miracles simplicity and then an issue about quranic exegesis so these are six problems that he mentions in his essay on why he believes that this particular approach doesn't hold weight so um 
I would yes. So to figure the way to make this a question, um, my whole thing would be asking, um, you know, because maybe you might not agree with this notion, but um, in light of these problems that have been addressed, um, if you were to read the essay or that there was something that from his points, do you think that that would change your position on the scientific miracle approach of the Quran? Actually, not not yet. Uh, mm -hmm. There there are many reasons, and uh, let me just uh, from what I remember from these points, and then you also tell me the other points because I kind of forgot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the first points is that uh, the religion will turn into a scientific a scientificism, not really a religion, not really an Islam, mm -hmm. which is already happening. Right. Some people would actually um, uh, like if we have like any. Um, uh, scientific um something like or like like let's say an order from prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to do something yes. and then some people would actually ask hey what's the reason behind this and no you don't actually ask for the reason once you believed in god you don't ask for the reason you just listen yeah. you know uh, because that's an order from god so that's that's the, what he means by scientificism which is actually happening right now um the thing is the thing is so wait, hold on. How do you know that that's science. what he means by scientism on the matter? I mean, that's what I understood, to be honest. Well, it's like scientism is basically like um, the idea, because I've talked with some people about this. Basically, they're saying that the only way we learn things is through science, including questions about morality. Um, God can be proven or disproven by science. Uh, I mean, can we observe God? Can we look at anything in the realm of biology and all these things and they say because we can't observe god himself in biology like that disproves uh god this would be was referred to as scientism is that science um explains all these things that he even cites a guy named jellies uh Ramen, who is a cardiology uh expert at indiana university school of medicine who mentions this with the problem of the scientific miracles narrative where he says quote one danger of such attempts to correlate modern science with the quran is that it makes a linkage between the perennial wisdom truth of the quran with the transient ideas of modern science so that's what it's trying to say is that science is being the ultimate lens of how we view things instead of the supernatural that the natural takes precedence over supernatural mm -hmm. okay yeah so that's perfect now now that you said this uh i wanted to mention so do you know how like science is actually not changing but facts are like scientific observations are actually changing with like yeah hey, a research paper like something then another research paper like one year later two years yeah. later that proves the other thing yeah and then that is totally okay yeah we would sleep on like scientific facts that are there because they're not really ready yet you know they're not really fully proven yet However, when you look at a, a very normal scientific observation, like, hey, mm -hmm. if you have watched a, 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 a rocket moves into space and you'll see it like vibrating, you know, not vibrating, but moving left and right, little by little. And uh, that is exactly what the Holy Quran mentioned, uh, mentioned and that is totally scientific. If you ask, also look at um, the embry embry embryology, and the, the stage of alaqa in a human being, you would actually look at it like even the pictures are right now that are looking exactly like that. So we're not really going very deep scientific, but deep enough to actually prove that this is a miracle, you know, mm -hmm. without even it being like totally a science thing. Because remember, I was uh, the examples that I brought was first is uh, about the classmates in a room where uh, you want to prove that they are honest or not. Mm -hmm. and then asking different things and that's to know that uh, his words prophet ﷺ, were not edited yeah and then the scientific thing which is the scientific evidence of this is something that we know that he's it's far beyond what he could have ad understood or what even the greeks themselves could have understood or maybe if they made a a theory there are also theories prevalent that are disproving these theories so what, how even would he choose the correct theory of him? I'd mention, mm -hmm. mention it in the Holy Quran. And so, and so in, this, in this matter alone, this is something that's even like, um, so you're, you're not really going that scientific. It's just like, hey, right. that's science, that's astrophysics, but that's not like the latest research papers and these kinds of things. Because mm -hmm. obviously the Holy Quran, uh, like describing something with three or four words, wouldn't actually uh, do justice such as a research, a research paper. Mm -hmm. All right. So 
and two just statements before I get into my question regarding something that you did mention earlier. I just to, I want to clarify that regarding what you stated about Protestants, um, we do affirm that there is a written law that is the Torah um, regarding you know that written particular law. Uh, but there is a deeper philosophical implication of the law regarding the natural law that is therefore preserved in the hearts of man. This is what Romans 2, 14 through 15 states regarding that the Gentiles, whenever they do something that is contained in the law, but they do not by nature have the law in terms of the physical book, they then have the law, they are a law unto themselves because the law has been written within their hearts. So we have this knowledge of morality based on this law being written in our hearts and having that innate knowledge because of God. Um, and with that, we account for that. Plus, we do have the written law at the same time regarding that. But furthermore, there's still what I mentioned at one point in our discussion uh, off air, which is that in Romans 13, the point of establishing and imposing these laws is, again, the government. Because, again, that's what God himself wants. So, I mean, who are we to disagree with God um, on what would be great and good is to allow the law to uh, the government who establishes the law with, through the form of, you know, uh, you know, presidents, uh, governors, um, senators, and the police to, you know, establish a particular law. These, they could be corrupt, but that doesn't negate what God states is the purpose of it. Um, just like, for example, there's the sheikhs in Islam who had that responsibility that God would appoint for them to, in your, at least in your religion, to deliver truth. But then, you know, there are some that will probably bring about certain falsehoods that could come about, um, by yeah. certain corrupt people and another point is that protestants don't necessarily choose according to feeling i know you mentioned that that we like determine things or come to conclusions or things based on feeling which isn't true unless you're a pentecostal which mostly happens within that particular tradition but protestants have been in the notion of logic and philosophy um and science such as for example there's Van Til, Bonson, Frame, Bosserman, Anderson, James N. Anderson, not to be confused with Stephen Anderson, uh, Vern Poitras, and several others that don't come to conclusions and even stated not by feeling, because that would be more so of the Immanuel Kant thing, where truth is confirmed by feeling, as well as the Mormons that state uh, religious truth is always confirmed only by feeling, not by uh, the empirical or the logical or the deductive but these particular christian philosophers have stated that it's they come to their conclusion by logic by observations and by what is was observed within the bible and what they observe of it as a logical uh work um so i just wanted to clarify those particular points but my question goes to you mentioned dua can change cotter um mm -hmm. yes okay so Regarding that, because I know I heard this from another uh, couple of individuals um, as well. I forget um, who was the uh, Muslim. I know he came into some controversy um, at one point. Oh, yeah, it was uh, Omar Sul uh, Suleiman as well as uh, Noman Ali Khan, where they talked about this particular thing. But here's the question. If Dua can change Qadr, and as we established in the history of things with Qadr, all things that will happen have been already written on these tablets of what is to come. But if Dua can change that, does this mean that God essentially just erases what was written from the beginning and then rewrites it, uh, rewrites a particular moment in the tablets? All right. To answer your question, we must first, uh, like just I mentioned before previously when I was talking in my first uh, 12 minutes, is that there are two types of Qadab. All right. And uh, one of them, like if we would call it the hanged qata, uh, qadar, I would say, and uh, the other one is the like things that Allah Zijal has written previously mm -hmm. uh, that we do not know about. And then with the hanged qadar, uh, if we look at the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, he said, "La al qada illa dua." So like uh, nothing will will change the the fortunate thing that's gonna happen except the prayers mm -hmm. and then what this means that it's totally referring to the hanged qadr so if we were talking about the law and these kinds of things and like these previous like uh like these eternal tablets that you want to mention 
these are not that qadr. There is a qadr that is going to be changed. That that is the hanged qadr. You, you understand where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Just like I mentioned, like it's basically what I mentioned. Nothing like uh, nothing like different. Okay. So just to get a clarification then on that, so um, when we're talking, so for example, let's say um, it has been predestined that from God via what's within the tablets that someone is uh, person A is going with person B uh, to see a movie um, mm -hmm. but if uh, the person uh, well actually because that let me rephrase that um, so person A is going to see the movie but person B can't because they're sick um, mm -hmm. and they were supposed to at least at one point in a previous time they promised to do so My, and this is all pre written in the uh, tablets w through the predestination if someone mm -hmm. then prays you know they can do a which is asking you know Allah mm -hmm. can you uh have this person healed for from their sickness before we can even go see this movie uh about a week from now um and then this happens with that point would then allah rewrite after erasing where he states that this person would be sick on that deal uh, and sick on that day because of sickness that's happened a bit earlier and then if you rewrite, oh yeah of course not Okay, so he wouldn't erase and rewrite that after the prayer yeah, happened. Yeah, because uh, remember, Allah Zajal knows everything, uh, mm -hmm. like er everything that happens and everything that will happen and everything that will happen if something didn't happen. Remember, like these kinds of things. Right. But so, I'm talking about the issue yeah, with the tablets then, with, with this. With the hand being... cutter that uh, mm -hmm. we wanted to tell you about, this is, uh, so, sorry, tell me. Sorry, sorry. I'm, so, I'm very sorry. No, no, no. I you didn't hear you. No, no, like, I'll, because, and I think you were probably going to get that, because, because I understand that, you know, we all agree, God knows everything, but then there's what is then predestined uh, through what is in Islam referred to as what is decreed on the tablets. And you mentioned that dua can change that. So if he prays for his friend to be able to go with him um, when originally it was written and predestined that he wouldn't because of this particular sickness, and if he prays for it, does that mean by the changing of Qadr from that? that God would then erase that moment and rewrite instead of person B couldn't make it because of a sickness, that now person B does tend the movie and therefore that changes the whole thing. Can that be the particular case? Sorry, uh, can you... Uh, you can have extra minutes, but I just didn't get mm -hmm. the... Like, so, uh... just basically, for example, person B, it was written person B couldn't see this movie with person A because he was sick. Person person A makes dua uh, mm. for him to be well enough to go see the movie on that day. If and that case happens, does therefore then God re erase saying person B couldn't make it and then rewrite person B can make it because of the dua that was mentioned um, to have him feel better so that he could come see it when originally it was predestined that that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Just like the, my answer before. Uh, my answer is like uh, obviously no because there is like this very old book. You know, like the Lawh al Mahfuz. But then with the hanged Qadar, uh, mm -hmm. yes. And then uh, I remember a verse. Uh, sorry. Uh, let Let me look at uh, where it is because uh, it's called Yam al Allah ma But mm -hmm. then uh, uh, let me find. Just let me make sure of the uh, phrasing. Sure. Um, yes, okay, yeah, it's also in Surah al Ra'd. Mm -hmm. So, Yamha Allah, Allah, who may I shout, we thabbit, we youthbit, or in the home kitab. So, basically, uh, Allah Azjal erases what He wants and uh, He um, stabilizes. No, I forgot the word in English. Mm -hmm. So, like, He erases and, not, and keeps what He wants. And then He said, and He has the mother of books. So, the mother of books doesn't uh, change okay you know? so that's the mother books that, that's the one that i told you it's obviously you no know. but the mother but of then books with... no go ahead yeah well yeah no, it's okay it's okay tell me tell me so uh the mother of books refers to though that portion because it's the context would then be about you know what is referred to as 
the Injil, the Torah, and therefore as well the Quran when it comes to stating the mother of books. Yeah? No, the Holy Quran, uh, these are uh, books, sky books. But the mother of books, that's the one that we don't know about, that I told you about. Like, okay. that's the one that that God wrote, like, lots of things, including Qadr on it. Okay, so, I mean, I definitely get that, but I was just wondering if that was specifically the context of that, if it was referring to just specifically the text, but as you stated, it's about um, Qadr as well. And you stated that in that verse, it says that he can rewrite it. Oh, uh, net verse? What? Uh, I heard you say something about rewrite. I just want to make sure I understood you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The hanged uh, Qadar. So basically, the Qadar... Oh, by the way, haven't you heard about this Qadar? Uh, if you heard about the jinn, like, actually trying to climb each other and become a tower and look at one of this, and that's why the, we have meteorites or these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, or that uh, some, uh, some uh, angels may have a look at these things. These are this is the hand of Qadr. So basically, this Qadr would actually be changed and rewritten, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and like get erased and rewritten. Mm -hmm. All right, so then with uh, then my last question because barely on time with this one, um, I would like to mention, okay, can take time. I would like to mention, uh, as I mentioned, there's the epistemological certainty thing of Surah 4 157 where it is made to appear that Jesus was crucified. Um, and regardless of what theory you hold to what may have happened to Jesus in light of these particular verses, uh, my question to you would be then, in light of this, and if God could do this to a particular event uh, for a purpose of his own divine knowledge and will uh, for whatever plan that God wants to bring about um, in this case, how therefore can you be certain of what you're actually experiencing for a 100% certainty. Um, like, for example, as I mentioned, the will holding a cup in my hand. How do you know you're actually looking at a screen on a computer or a phone um, instead of something else, but your mind is perceiving of it uh, differently in that? Because to me, this proposes uh, a bigger issue than the issue of did Jesus actually get crucified, but a much bigger one in a philosophical thing regarding having epistemological certainty, accounting for knowing your certainty of what you're experiencing in your touch, your sight, your sense of smell, all of these things. How do you know that they are certain and not just things that appear so by the will of Allah? Uh, can you please, oh, I'm very sorry. Like I don't, I didn't get to anything. Like for when you said like looking at the screen and these kinds of things, I, mm -hmm. I got lost. All right, so like for example, um, looking at the screen on your uh, phone or your computer or whatever you're uh, observing this on how do you know that it's actually that and not something else at that point like for example like you could see it as that but how do you know that that's what you're actually seeing it as instead of it just appearing as so and furthermore be like the issue as i mentioned the assassination of abraham lincoln how do you know that that actually happened regarding epistemological certainty from your reading of it, if that's actually what you're reading or seeing uh, in reports, and if the people that witnessed it themselves were actually certain of what they were seeing instead of it just appearing as so. Oh, okay. So first, let me go back to the Jewish case. Uh, uh, like, uh, how do I know that they were, they know that they didn't crucify Jesus, they crucified someone else. And uh, the easiest answer is because I got the story from someone I trust. And that's the honesty. Like, that's the honest answer. Uh, like, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, there's a philosophical thing behind it. And then there's a meta metaphysical thing. It's because I trust the words of Allah mm -hmm. after, like, having the, uh, uh, having something that actually made me believe that uh, these are Islam is the true word. And then I would believe everything that God would say, mm -hmm. you know. But then and so this is what, how I... Yeah, tell me. But then in the cases where it's not recorded in the Quran, such as, for example, the case of the assassination of Lincoln, um, how do we know that that's what actually happened in that particular case for you? Because I don't think it was God telling you directly that, you know, Lincoln got assassinated regarding that particular information. You look at the proofs. But what are the proofs then? I mean, I don't know how Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Well, the the, the history is that he got uh, he was at a theater to watch a performance, 
and a guy, uh, John Wilkes Booth, um, came in the theater from behind, sat behind him, and pulled out a pistol to shoot him in the back of the head from his seat, and then tried to leave. Okay. So don't they see, like, a bullet uh, behind his head and, like, in front, like... Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, but what's, what's the problem, you know? The problem is on accounting for it as you today would be able to know for certain that this actually happened in light of, again, in the way that we're observing the issue of Jesus' crucifixion, as people from the present looking at it from the past, or, or looking at it actually, from the future. So, let me reply with the story of Jesus himself. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you believe in this story or not. So, uh, basically, there was this story, and, like, the moral of the story is too long, but, like, uh, mm -hmm. just the first part of the story, which happened, was that Jesus was walking with someone, or, like, so he found someone, and then they decided to, to travel together. Mm -hmm. And then when they traveled together, uh, they shared uh, some bread. Or they decided to share some bread, like 50-50. And then uh, when, when uh, like, the time uh, they were hungry or, like, the time of dinner or lunch wanted to come and, like, they wanted to eat, uh, they found that the bread was uh, finished. And then Jesus actually saw the other guy eat all of the bread. So he asked, who ate the bread? And then uh, that guy said, like, something like, I don't know, or something like that. And mm -hmm. then Jesus said, like, he gave him a hint, like, it's okay, you can say that it was you. And then he said, uh, I swear to God, it's not me. And then what did Jesus actually reply to him? He said, your swear is correct, and my eyes are false. Since you swear it. I, uh, like, since the word of God is, like, so important to him, at least, that he believed a swear over or, uh, over a uh, over his eyes. And this is exactly the thing. Like, if I believe that God is absolute and God knows everything and he was there all, uh, with us all of the time, I would believe him more than, supposedly, if he said to me something, I would believe him more than a camera. If, like, there is a word from Quran or, like, Prophet Sallallahu saying something, I would believe him more than a camera, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the whole point of also Hadith uh, al-Isra and al-Mi'raj, where basically um, Prophet Sallallahu literally claimed something so impossible that nobody saw, but then he actually proved them right, well, like, with the evidences. But then Abu Bakr Sadiq literally said, if he claimed so, then I believe him. End of the story. Mm -hmm. But that's regarding like the deal on the crucifixion on that regarding what you know God Himself states, and you mentioned that that's a reliable source. But I'm talking about like something that isn't then recorded in the Quran, such as the assassination of Lincoln uh, regarding one particular deal. And even we could go with the example you mentioned about the the students um, who didn't want to take a test, uh, so they gave an excuse that the tire went flat and they wanted to delay. Uh, the exam uh, regarding the whole particular uh, thing on there and then you mentioned they get the test so number one say that they actually did have supposedly an actual like deal with a flat tire uh, thing that caused the excuse to be valid to delay the exam how do they know that that was mm -hmm. actually the case the tire was actually flat and something else didn't happen at that point even though they can look and see well the tire is flat it looks like a spike or something went through that popped it. How do you know that's actually what they're observing? And even if that's actually a tire, furthermore, if we then go to the test and they're looking at um, the questions on there, how do they know that there's actually words on it? And this is not something that their mind is perceiving or it appears as so in a sense that this is just what it looks like and appears as so, but in all actuality, there is no words on the test and they're just writing on a blank sheet of paper in actuality compared to what they're looking and observing from their own senses how do how can we be oh it's like mm -hmm. like like basically just having eyes and feeling and all these kinds of things like basically you are asking how do i know if i'm alive or not or like <laughs> something just something similar to that but it's more about not being alive but rather it's about observing what we're seeing is actually what we are observing instead of an appearing as so or an illusion in this case. 
Okay. Uh, actually, even if it was an illusion, my my answer would be this: even if it was an illusion, why wouldn't it matter? Uh, at the same time, in both cases, if you are like knowing that this is something, you would still actually work hard for it. It's like mm -hmm. imagine that you are uh, preparing for um, a war or hell or like something that's gonna come, like droughts. If that was an uh, illusion, would you still go and plant? You would still go and plant it because you don't even know that it's an illusion. If you you have a doubt if it was whether an illusion or not, you still go and uh, plant things preparing for the drought. You will still yeah. build your weapons. You will still like do things like that. Mm -hmm. So why does it even matter from uh, will it be matter, the start? You know, that... Will it be mattering regarding the issue of being certain about uh, things that are actually true and in order for them to be facts, um, whether it be statements that we make or events these are two different categories of facts is truth statements as well as events in history uh supposedly being true they would have to have actually happened instead of being an illusion if they were an illusion then they cease to be an event or they cease to be facts as a result of the very definition and notion of these things in philosophical terms that they would have to actually exist and therefore it would just be seen as an illusion that appears to us as so just like for example it appear you would say that the crucifixion didn't actually happen for jesus because it appeared as so but therefore that means because of that as you would state and affirm that it the crucifixion of jesus was not a historical or logical event or fact um but rather it was again just an illusion so therefore that situation we could apply to oh. anything else Actually, actually, no. This is this is oh, okay. Yeah. This is this is what you are to, to object on. Yeah. Now I understand. Uh, basically, yes, but we also know that the Jewish themselves actually knew that they weren't crucifying Jesus. So that's the whole point. The question is, mm -hmm. how do we verify that they have actually crucified Jesus himself, or they were actually all knowing that it was not Jesus and doing well, that? You know, we, that's we do. that's I think a more appropriate question right well we do have jews that do state that jesus was indeed crucified though they like to be a little more insulting about jesus the only one that i've observed that doesn't be like that would be josephus who was a jew that writes in the antiquities of the jews uh the crucifixion of jesus and why uh the roman prefix decided to have him crucified um on account of the jews uh regarding that particular manner and what some of his believers then thought him to be so josephus actually as a jew gives a very historical account on this as a historian and there are other jewish works which do affirm jesus is crucified and they say they know they crucify him but they go a little more insulting basically calling jesus basically like the son of a whore and all these particular uh things so there are jews that don't doubt that jesus was crucified but they know for a fact that he was which that's of the point of the Quranic verses that says that they believe that uh, to be the case. But in actuality, it didn't, according to the Quran, because it says it only appeared as so. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. So, that, what's the problem here? I, I still don't understand. So, the problem is if they can't be epistemologically certain that Jesus was crucified uh, because God decided to cause this illusion to make it appear as if he was, but in actuality, he wasn't. How then can you be certain that you're not seeing or under or witnessing a appearing as so or an illusion from God today? Oh, okay, okay. Wait a second. So uh, first, let's address the problem itself. Um, in that case, mm -hmm. God specifically mentioned that it was a miracle, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then um, with the crucifixion of uh, Jesus, that act in itself is an infidel act, right? Okay. The killing of Jesus himself. So the result of it all being crucified or not, and uh, you believing it uh, happened or not, it's not really that important. It's the, what's important is the act itself. Like what you did or what are you going to do afterwards? Now, that uh, about how do I know that it's not a an illusion that I'm seeing or not? It's because I trust God already. And he told me that, you know, like I have like proof and like I've seen proof that 
Islam is the true religion. So when Allah just says that no, He actually changed that person or things from that regard. I don't recall the exact story into a person looking exactly like Jesus. I would still believe that. But would things change because of them killing someone else instead of killing Jesus himself? Of course not. Because in there, and this is the, the, the third of Islam, as some scholars call it, it's the biggest concept in Islam, and it's about the niyyah, the intention. So I still don't like... I mean, I'm doing my intentions. I have my intentions. I'm doing everything. And then God will actually uh, treat me and like he would actually test me and uh, evaluate me, sorry, evaluate me on the judgment day, all, all based on my intention, not based on my just like pure act. And that is the exact thing. Uh, they will get um, punished for trying to kill Jesus. And for their intention of killing Jesus, not for like them actually killing someone else. Mm -hmm. All right then. So I did go over a bit more of my time, and I apologize on that part. Uh, no, it's but, fine. But uh, yeah, I think this has been a very uh, helpful uh, conversation regarding this. It definitely gave me a lot to learn about regarding certain ideas you got, as well as just in general notions on Islam. And hopefully the same was for you uh, regarding the Christian. Um, yeah, yeah I actually learned a lot. Um, just yes. uh, any final points you would like to, uh, uh, just like a very brief, quick uh, final point you would like to add for uh, uh, this particular discussion? I mean, if you want, two minutes. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, yeah, uh, just a quick recap. I was mentioning how the words haven't changed. Uh, uh, or edited from the time of Prophet Sallallahu I also mentioned how we can verify the history of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I also mentioned how uh, actually the scientific proofs work perfectly. Uh, also after your question about uh, Dr. Hamza, uh, if I recall correctly, and how they are still actually scientific proof that stand with the Holy Quran. And that's why we didn't go into so much details, but enough details. I also mentioned about... Um, uh, how Islam created the perfect law and order and uh, by setting up lots of things, lots of cases and even uh, giving knowledge and giving the measurements at, uh, a chance during the time of Prophet Sallallahu when he sent people to, uh, oh sorry, I didn't mention that, uh, during Al-Habasha and uh, like during the Hijras when he sent scientists, uh, scholars with him. So he actually gave a testimony to the measurements uh, way of uh, doing the uh, Sharia and fatwa. Um, <clears throat> one last thing about uh, my point is that uh, all these points are exactly what I believe that Christianity lacks, uh, especially like Protestant uh, uh, Christianity. Uh, there is no exact way of uh, addressing everyone uh, during that uh, time, or during that period. Uh, also, um, like there's something that it lacks, like the new theology. Uh, there's no way in the Bible. Even the Bible itself doesn't even specify the books that are contained in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, about the Protestant, hey, like uh, of governments, like if if it's really was the right way of doing a government, then why didn't we have a good government until like the late 1900s or like yeah, 1900s? Um, also, I was mentioning about like a couple of points regarding. Um, like how Unitarian and like having one God is actually uh, a totally illogical thing. And that it, it shows us that the one and many is the flawed logic, not actually the logic itself, because uh, it's even harder to understand as a normal person. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Actually, I, I would like to thank RCF Colleges. If you guys watch this, I know he recorded the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I actually respect him a lot, and he's one of the people that, like, I totally respect. Well, uh, mm -hmm. because we actually had a very fair discussion, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, do appreciate that, and thank you for that. Um, so, thank you for the conversation, man. You're welcome, man.